Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Rick Flagg. Played by Joel Kinnaman, Rick Flagg was in the 2016 Suicide Squad film, directed by David Ayer, and it wasn't received well by the public, so much so that fans have been petitioning for a release of the hashtag Ayer Cut. But that's, uh, yeah, it's not gonna happen, I don't think. But we do get another shot with our loved characters. This time around, Rick Flagg looks even more badass. Rick Flagg is an elite soldier and government agent who works for Task Force X. So like we see in the film adaptation, Rick is the leader of the first Suicide Squad. Yes, they are more than one, which I'll get into later. Amanda Waller enlisted him when she created the Suicide Squad, which is a task force made of supervillains who take on these high-risk missions in order to get parole, reduce sentences, freedom, something glorious, something to look forward to, to use their abilities in a good way, or some kind of good way. He made his first comic book debut in the Brave and the Bold issue 25, titled The Three Waves of Doom. And we're looking forward to seeing James Gunn version of him come August 4th. The third wave of doom. Sounds familiar up here in Canada, hence why I'm in my apartment. And before we continue with some other dangerous Suicide Squad members, guys, that like button needs some love right now. You can feel it, I don't know, it's right there. It wants a little so if you wanna go ahead and click that, it helps our studio out quite a bit. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now let's get right back into this list. I don't wanna to waste too much every time. Number nine, Bloodsport. <laughs> Idris Elba is making the jump from a major Marvel character to a major Superman villain. That's right, Bloodsport. He made his first comic book debut back in Superman Volume 2, Issue 14, and the first Bloodsport, there's of course more than one, that's how these things go, classic comic book villains, but the first one was Robert Dubois. Robert got drafted as a young man, but instead fled to Canada, and his brother had to take his place instead. Now his brother Mickey ended up losing his arm and legs when he got drafted, so Robert was a little messed up after carrying that guilt with him. So much so that he spent the next 12 years going back and forth between psychiatric hospitals. That is until Lex Luthor found him and used him as a way to take down Superman. He gave Robert this device that could teleport any weapon to him, and one of them of course being a gun that fires needles of kryptonite. So they used his guilt and made him into one of the most feared members. Whatever version of this character we get in the James Gunn film, I'm sure it will be a blast. Pun intended. Number eight, King Shark. And? Yes, that is your hand. Very good. Yeah, it's kind of hard to miss that guy in the trailer because, you know, he's a shark. We have a shark now, great. Who's this shark guy? What's going on? Is it Left Shark? Well, he made his comic book debut back in Superboy Volume 4. He was born in Hawaii and he's a humanoid shark which I probably didn't need to point out, but his father is the king of all sharks, literally referred to as the shark god. So he was responsible for a few missing persons case, of course, being a hungry shark living in Hawaii and all, and it took a combination of heavy weaponry and sheer luck just to bring him in. Sam Makoa was the one who had to bring him in as well. What a unlucky ship. And several officers were actually taken out during this, so it was quite a mess. Now, as far as his origins go, for the Suicide Squad movie, they could go either way because his sharkness is rumored to come from a variety of sources. He says his dad is a shark god, but others have said he's just a wild man, which is a race of humanoid animals, and the government thinks he's just a savage mutation from an experiment gone wrong. Either way, he's kind of cute and he's a shark, so I love him. Number seven, Taskmaster. Taskmaster wasn't just a member of the Thunderbolts, he's also been known for being their leader. Like Rhino before him, Taskmaster was also recruited to join the Kingpin's version of the team, but has been involved with the Thunderbolts even before that. Taskmaster is Tony Masters in the comics, a man who is known for being an extremely efficient mercenary and assassin. He has what's referred to as photographic reflexes, which were gifted to him via an experimental version of the super soldier serum. However, even before he was injected with the serum, Masters had the skill to watch various abilities and moves and just be able to replicate them just from seeing them. But now that ability is pretty much instantaneous. The serum also greatly enhanced his short term memory and heightened his reflexes and speed to superhuman levels. Number six, Bronze Tiger. Ben Turner is one of the best when it comes to martial arts. He actually is the best. He studied with Richard Dragon under the O Sensei, but was later brainwashed by the League of Assassins. So we have a great fighter, and then just like that, we have a well-trained fighter on their team. Awesome, that was sick, what's the point of that? He's one of the coolest members because he doesn't have powers, which is amazing, and I had to include him in this list. He's just that good at fighting. He has quick reflexes, and he's mastered pretty much every style of fighting. Be it boxing, jiu-jitsu, karate, muay thai, taekwondo, you name it, he can break your arms in so many ways. I think that's a better way of putting it. His chai manipulation ability certainly does come in handy though. He uses this to enhance his concentration and heal quicker. In Suicide Squad issue seven, Bronze Tiger is actually able to defeat the speedster 
bowl showing. So no powers, but he can still take out a speedster. That's pretty impressive. Number five, the Frightful Four. Ah, a second group inspired by the Fantastic Four. Yes, the Frightful Four also did not come up with a very clever name. The Wizard, the Sandman, and Pastepot Pete, who all regularly did battle with the Human Torch and were defeated by him around the same time, realized that they all had unique powers and a mutual disdain for the Fantastic Four. The Wizard suggested that they form a group that would be the evil counterparts to the Fantastic Four. A great idea! But it's just three dudes. They need a fourth member to their group, and what do you know, the wizard had heard of a strange woman hiding out on a remote island on the Mediterranean who had complete control of her hair. Traveling there, the wizard convinced Madame Medusa to join their ranks. Now this Madame Medusa was actually Medusa of the Inhumans as some of you may have guessed, but she was kept under the influence of the wizard using a device that kept her memories forgotten to her. They made their first attack at Mr. Fantastic and Invisible Woman's engagement party, which is kind of just rude if you ask me. Number 4, Count Vertigo. The villain that makes you puke. Werner Vertigo made his first debut in World's Finest issue 251 and he comes from the Vladivan royal family and like his name gives away, his superpower is pretty unique and kind of gross. He makes his enemies disoriented, okay? So he started off by going against Black Canary and Green Arrow, but eventually he made his way to the Suicide Squad. Now, his initial plan before the Suicide Squad was quite simple. He went to Star City to steal back some jewels that his parents had sold when they escaped to England after the war. So he was born with an inner ear problem that affected his balance. So he had a device that helped out planted in the right side of his temple. Now, after messing around with the device, which is something you don't do with any device near your temple, he realized that he had the ability to distort others' perception. Now, it was so bad that they couldn't tell which way was up or down. So he ended up on the naughty list, of course, but he accepted an offer to join the Suicide Squad in order to get his prison sentence reduced. Number three, Moonstone. You know I have to give love to my girl, Carla Sofen. Moonstone is probably one of the most powerful members of the Thunderbolts to have ever joined the team. Initially, she got her powers from the Moonstone, hence her name. She stole it from the previous Moonstone, Lloyd Bloch, actually using her psychiatric skills to emotionally traumatize Bloch to the point that his body rejected the stone, allowing her to take it for herself. Moonstone has stood up against and taken down Carol Danvers, one of the strongest heroes in the Marvel Universe, and Carla herself has been a longtime enemy of Danvers, going back through to her Miss Marvel days. Currently, Carla is fused with the Kree Gravity Stone, which is what grants Carla her current powers. She still goes by the name Moonstone, though. Carla initially joined the original Thunderbolts under the guise of the heroic code name Meteorite. Number two, Enchantress, aka June Moon. She made her first debut back in Strange Adventures issue 187 back in 1966, where right at the top it says, Meet the Switcheroo Witcheroo, the Enchantress. Now it sounds fun, but she's actually a nightmare. She, of course, is a member of the Suicide Squad, and Cara Delevingne played her in the first movie. But in the comics, her origins are pretty tragic. See, June Moon was a freelance artist who was dating this guy named Alan Dell. Dell invited her out one evening to a party at the haunted Terror Castle, which sounds like a good time for sure. But while she was there, she fell into a chamber with this being named Zaymor, which granted her witch powers. So now every time she says the name Enchantress, she changes into a green-eyed, powerful Enchantress. The downside is whenever June uses these enchantress abilities and creates magic too quickly, her personality becomes volatile and evil, which explains how she dips into the villain role. And finally, number one, Amanda Waller. I have to cap this list off with the boss lady herself. She made her debut in DC Comics with Legends issue one, and she was a powerful political figure who has been in many law enforcement agencies. They referred to her as The Wall because of how aggressive and stubborn she is. She rebuilt Task Force X with Rick Flagg assigned to work under her, who I mentioned at the beginning of this list. And eventually she revived the Suicide Squad under her own direction. She's a great character. I mean, Suicide Squad issue 10 was titled Up Against the Wall. It is a fan favorite with her. Many fans have pointed out that this was the issue where we had the biggest change of pace and it stepped it up for the Suicide Squad quite a bit. It's this epic story that puts the Dark Knight himself against Amanda Waller. So in this issue, Batman discovers the existence of the Suicide Squad, and his next step of action is to threaten Amanda and say that he's going to blow the whistle on the whole operation, but Amanda doesn't handle that offer too well because, well, she's the wall. She explains back to Batman that if he does this, she will use everything in her power to find out who he is and expose him. See, because he used his matches Malone cover, he wasn't wearing gloves. So when he first investigated Belrave Penitentiary, no gloves means fingerprints. 
So that threat is not a bad threat at all, Amanda Waller. No powers and you're calling the shots. You're number one in my books. Number 10, the S-Men. Red Skull being the dastardly devil he is, made some backup plans in the case of his eventual demise. One such plan was a clone of himself who would come back in the modern era. Okay, side note, why do villains do this, making clones of themselves? The individual villain still kind of passes away, so if they move their consciousness or something, that kind of makes sense, but I don't get why this is a thing. But I'm pretty sure this clone isn't even like that. I'm gonna make myself upset, so let's just continue. Basically, waking up in this new modern world with mutants and all that jazz, this new Red Skull decided that he was going to dig up the body of Professor X and steal some of his brain. Granting himself some telepathy, and as an antithesis to the X-Men, he created the S-Men. Ah. Yes, very creative. This was a group of individuals that the Red Skull had empowered using crazy mad science and magic. Almost all of them were pretty quickly taken out of existence by Magneto when this Red Skull tried to make a camp to exterminate mutants. Bad move, buddy. Bad move. Number 9, Zodiac Cartel. Honestly, it's a pretty cool idea for a group. This villainous group of hand-picked business leaders who were all born under different zodiac signs as their leader Cornelius Van Lunt, or Taurus, was heavily into astrology. Each member, while representing a zodiac sign, also was based in a different American city and their main goal was world economic and political domination. Its members originally were, other than Cornelius, Scorpio, Jake Fury, Aquarius, Darren Bentley, Aries, Marcus Lassiter, Cancer, Jack Cleveno, Capricorn, Willard Weir, Gemini, Joshua Link, Leo, Daniel Radford, Libra, Gustav Brandt, Pisces, Noah Perricone, Sagittarius, Harlan Vargas, and my representative, Virgo, Elaine McLaughlin. The team was first formed after the dissolution of a previous group called the Great Wheel of Zodiac, which had covert agents from around the globe, including Baron Von Strucker, Dum Dum Dugan, and even Leonardo da Vinci. Its dissolution also led to the creation of S.H.I.E.L.D., Hydra and Leviathan as well. So you could definitely say it was important and somehow still relatively obscure. Number eight, Headman. Sometimes it takes the smallest of things to bring people together. And while that may sound like an extremely beautiful sentiment, I'm saying it in relation to the villainous team known as the Headman, who it seems came together because each of their powers revolves around their heads in one way or another. And it's honestly kind of unsettling in my opinion. Bonded together through their heads, these scientists sought out world domination, bringing them into conflict with the Defenders, She-Hulk, and Spider-Man. This quartet consisted of Arthur Nagin, their leader, who had his head transplanted onto the body of a gorilla, Ruby Thursday, who replaced her own head with an organic computer capable of changing shape, Gerald Morgan, aka Shrunken Bones, accidentally shrank his own skeleton, including his skull, so he basically has really baggy skin, and Chandu, the mystic's head, has been transplanted transplanted by Nagin onto a number of different bodies throughout his time, making him quite versatile. Number seven, Parasite. Rudolph Rudy Jones. He made his first appearance in Firestorm Volume 2, Issue 58, and he started off as a janitor at the Pittsburgh branch of Star Labs. But like anything else that happens at Star Labs, his life was soon changed forever because there was an accident. Well, not really an accident, but while nobody was around, Darkseid turned Rudy into this new version of the Parasite. See, he had existed before Crisis on Infinite Earths, but then that's when Maxwell Jensen was Parasite, so. Darkseid controlled him, made him open a waste container, and then he was exposed to this radiation that turned him into this new green skin, well, Parasite, of course. So now Rudy has the ability to absorb all the life out of others, leaving just a skeleton sitting there behind. How gross would that be to find on a bus? Now his own body constantly needs to consume more and more or else he won't be able to survive. Hungry, hungry parasite, what a menace. Number six, the UFOs. Ah, these villains and their cleverly chosen team names. UFOs, like UFOs, because they got their powers in space. Yes, of course. Someone get me out of here. Please. Okay, the UFOs here, inspired by the powers gained by the Fantastic Four, went to great lengths trying to reproduce the same accident that gave those heroes their abilities. 
The attempt succeeded, but they were interrupted by Bruce Banner, who discovered their ground control facility and was able to bring the shuttle down, because he thought it had been exposed to the cosmic radiation by accident. They were none too happy as they thought they could have been made even stronger if he had not interfered, and they displayed their newfound powers in a frankly pretty awesome fight with the Incredible Hulk even if they lost. Vapor has the ability to alter her form into any known gas. Vector gained the power of telekinesis from cosmic rays. X-ray has been permanently transformed into a living energy field with the power to expel forms of heavy radiation capable of hurting even the Hulk. Ironclad has been permanently transformed into organic metal steel. He has superhuman strength, durability, and the ability to decrease or increase his own weight. His fight with the Hulk literally shook the universe, which is super cool. You should probably check him out. Number 5. Juggernaut Juggernaut is Kane Marco, the villainous stepbrother of Charles Xavier aka Professor X. Unlike his brother Charles, Kane himself is a human, not a mutant, and he originally got his powers from Sidorak, being granted the Crimson Gem of Sidorak, and becoming his champion on Earth. Currently though, Juggernaut's ties to Sidorak as his champion and avatar have been broken. Instead, for his powers, Juggernaut Juggernaut relies on the crimson bands of Sidorak, which do not tie the user to Sidorak's will in the same way. This means that Kane now basically gets to operate independent of Sidorak's will or influence, using the powers of the crimson band armor for his own interests. Kane became a member of Luke Cage's Thunderbolts team for a time before he was made into one of the Serpent's champions during the Fear Itself event. Number 4. Wrecking Crew When Dirk Garthwaite, otherwise known as Wrecker, held onto his enchanted crowbar, he invited his three chums, ex physicist Dr. Elliot Franklin, ex Army Master Sergeant Henry Camp, and ex farmhand Brian Kaluski to come and do the same in the middle of a thunderstorm. When lightning struck the crowbar, all three men were empowered, becoming Thunderball, Bulldozer, and Piledriver, respectively, and coming together to be the villainous wrecking crew. These mystical strongmen were mainly an enemy to Thor, but they originally fought against the Defenders. This group has actually been around for a pretty long time and have battled many a superhero. The Fantastic Four, Avengers, Omega Flight, Spider-Man, the Thunderbolts, and even got into a fight between the Marvel and DC universes. Number 3, Deadshot. Played by the Fresh Prince himself, Will Smith, in the other Suicide Squad movie, Deadshot aka Floyd Lawton made his first comic book debut in Batman issue 59. His origin stories are pretty dark, okay? So his parents were both wealthy and they idolized his older brother Edward a lot. Now his father was unfaithful so his mother actually asked her two sons to take him out. That's terrible. So Edward locked Floyd in the boathouse because Floyd wanted to go and at least warn his father, you know, tell him what was going on. So Floyd broke out and he grabbed a hunting rifle where he climbed a tree and saw that his brother had already shot his father. He wasn't dead, but he was paralyzed after the first shot. But then when Edward was preparing to take another shot to end him, Floyd aimed his rifle and shot at him. Now, Floyd meant to disarm him. He meant to, but the branch that he was on had snapped at the last second, so that bullet actually went through the middle of his eyes, which uh, dished out a lot more damage than he intended to. So he took out the brother he loved to protect the father that he hated. That sounds just like a DC villain, if you ask me. So after that point, he was trained by David Kane to become the professional assassin we now know as Deadshot. Number two, Death Throws. Remember how the headmen all came together based on their head related powers? Well, I'll do you one better. How about the Death Throws, whose powers and names all have something to do with commonly throwing stuff? The leader, ringleader, threw together teammates Bombshell, Knick Knack, Oddball, Tenpin, and Throwdown into a group that works really well together, juggling their weapons between each other and doing battle with characters like Captain America, Crossfire, Hawkeye, and even Loki of all people who stopped the group from robbing the big top casino in Las Vegas. The Marvel Wiki even lists their origins as quote unquote, joint effort to perform criminal and mercenary acts while using juggling expertise. I honestly kind of had a hoot putting together this point, as I can't believe this group of villains even exists. And lastly at number one is Horticulture. Okay, of all the teams on this list, I think the Horticulture are my favorite. For starters, they look so cool. But then, you find out it's a bunch of older women between the ages of 64 to 81 who are all expert botanists and want to bring Earth back to its more pristine time when it had about 7 billion less people on it. 
I just love how they use their regular names and the names just kind of suit their age and interest in plants. I don't know how, but they kind of just do. Augusta Bromes, Lily Lamus, Edith Scutch, and Opal Vetiver. Gosh. But yes, that's right, these ladies want to basically exterminate most of the Earth's human population and bring plants back to the forefront, specifically flowers. This goal brings them into conflict with the X-Men in 2019's X-Men number 3. Beyond biological modifications believed to have been made to themselves, the women of horticulture are experts at manipulating the environment to suit their extinction agenda. And they're also computer programmers, selling software to Orcus to monitor Krakoan gateways. But seriously, look at them. They're just awesome. Number 10, Bullseye. While Lester might not be powerful in the more traditional sense of being, you know, the most swole, his abilities do make him a rather deadly opponent. Bullseye might not have many superpowers to boast of, but he does have the almost superhuman skill of being able to hit a bullseye with almost any projectile. Bullseye is a master marksman known for his deadly accuracy, but he also does have something that makes him more durable than most. Adamantium. Adamantium is fused with part of his skeleton in a process similar to the one Wolverine underwent. In fact, it was the man who originally came up with that process, Lady Deathstrike's father, Lord Darkwin, aka Kenji Oyama, who gave Bullseye this power. Bullseye was initially recruited to join Norman Osborn's Thunderbolts. Number 9, Rhino. Rhino might be a ridiculous villain on paper and in the 60s Spider Man cartoon, but he also happens to be one of the most powerful when it comes to Spider Man's gallery of rows. Rhino is Alexei Sistovich, a villain who started out as a goon for the Russian Mafia, dreaming of wealth and power. Alexei ended up being convinced to participate in a series of treatments which would inevitably grant him super strength through bonding him to an armor that was fashioned to look like a rhinoceros. As such, he is not only super strong, but also is super fast and super durable, although not so bright. Rhino actually ended up becoming a member of Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin's own Thunderbolts team, which was was assembled during the King in Black event. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. After all, there are tons more Thunderbolt members. Tons more. Number eight, Plant Man. Some might think of Plant Man as a B or even a C list villain, and based on how much he's shown up in the comics over the years and what he has, or rather, kind of hasn't managed to accomplish in his villainy, you you'd kind of be right. But Plant Man also recently got a pretty big power up in the comics thanks to the Empire event and the Katati, who he allied himself with during their attack on Earth. The Katati are a plant-like race who were once the neighbors of the Kree. They're much more peaceful but highly advanced neighbors, who were actually pitted against the Kree when the Skrulls came to visit. Bearing a grudge for the Kree, the Skrull, and the humans of Earth, the Katati set out to destroy all animal-based life. Plant Man decided to join their side as, at this point, Samuel Smithers identified more as a plant than a man, and in fact didn't even like his human name being used. His powers allow him to communicate with and command plant and vegetable matter. He also seems to be somewhat telepathic, and as he is now completely made of vegetable matter, he can control his density and size, making him very hard to destroy and super strong and durable when he wants to be. It was during his time with the Thunderbolts, the Plant Man actually took the name Black Heath for himself, which is currently what he prefers to go by. It's either Black Heath or Plant Man. Number seven, Circus of Crime. Fritz Tibbolt, then manager and ringmaster of a small Austrian circus, became active in the Axis powers during World War II. He was asked by German intelligence to take his circus to the United States of America to give performances in major cities while actually using his circus members' powers and talents in order to take out government officials. Fritz Tibbolt's evil circus of crime consisted of Omir the Snake Charmer, Tommy Thumb, the Trapeze Trio, and Zandau the Strongman. However, Tibbolt, who came to be known as the Ringmaster of Death, was captured by Captain America. But fast forward and the Circus of Crime's new MO was giving a performance to a large audience, then the ringmaster would use the powerful mind control device in his hat to put the audience into a trance. The circus members then robbed the audience who would remember nothing about the thefts when the ringmaster released them from the trance, and the performance continued. 
This criminal circus fought the Hulk, Spider Man, the Hawkeyes, the Avengers, and others. Number 6 Star Star was one of the villains recruited into Kingpin's Thunderbolts team. Initially, Star was posing as a hero. She underwent a treatment that made her half Cree and part of Minerva's plot to isolate and then later recruit Captain Marvel, aka Carol Danvers. Before she was known as Star, though, she was Ripley Ryan, a reporter who actually was saved at one point by Captain Marvel herself. Minerva, having also promised Star superpowers, however, decided to siphon them from Carol Danvers due to an earlier plot which gave her the abilities to basically do so. Really, she just wanted to alienate Carol and ruin her reputation so that Captain Marvel would join the Kree Empire. She didn't really want to hurt Carol in the long run. However, when Star found out about this, found out about the fact that Minerva wanted to recruit Carol, she became jealous and almost killed Minerva in a rage. The fight came down to Captain Marvel versus Star, with Carol removing the devices in both her own and Ripley's chests, which allowed Star to siphon her powers. Later on, though, Star would become merged with the Reality Stone, giving her access to unlimited amounts of reality altering power. However, Star is not very experienced in her use of these powers yet, but she does have great potential, which is why I ranked her so high on this list. Number five, Windfall. Wendy Jones, a former member of the Masters of Disaster, made her DC debut back in Batman in The Outsiders issue nine. Now, she got her powers originally after her mother let her company performed DNA experiments on Wendy and her sister Becky. It was so awful what they went through that Becky actually took out her own mother later in life because of this. She was not happy and she carried a lot of guilt. So her and her sister were once part of the Masters of Disaster, but while Wendy was in school later on, these frat guys assaulted her, to say the least, just awful human beings, and one of those jerks' father was the local district attorney, and he refused to make a case for her when she reported it because of her past as a supervillain. Although his own son is a piece of shit monster. For sure, that makes sense, good logic. Now the college actually kicked Wendy out for this whole scandal, scandal, so Wendy returned later to the college and got some good old fashioned revenge, suffocating that same fraternity by removing the air from their house. So after she was put in Bell Rave Penitentiary, then that's when Amanda recruited her for the Suicide Squad. Number four, Janice Val. Janice Val is the son of Marvel, and honestly, he's kind of the worst in my opinion, but he is also very powerful and actually died during his time on the Thunderbolts team, which means he definitely deserves a place on this list. However, I refuse to name this point after his last super code name Photon because I cannot abide by all the code name stealing that he did. Like you make Monica Rambeau give up the Captain Marvel mantle for you and then you come back to Earth and demand Photon as well? Too rude, sir. Too rude. Regardless of his name theft, Janis Vell was known for being extremely powerful due to his heritage as both a Kree and a Titan. His energy based powers, as a result, were known for being off the charts. Number three, Menagerie. The Menagerie is likely a more recent evil team, showing up for the first time in Amazing Spider Man Volume 3, number one, in April of 2014, when they tried to steal valuable decorated eggs from an antique store and were pretty easily defeated. So like, from the get go, the impressive feats are on the lower side of the list, if you know what I'm saying. In fact, I'd say the most famous thing they've done is when they disintegrated Spider-Man's spider suit, making him have to create web underwear for himself. And it's kind of the underwear that is remembered here, not the menagerie. The animal themed criminal team was created by White Rabbit, and its members included Hippo, Ox, Skine, who did the spider suit disintegrating, Squid, Swarm, and wait for it. Panda Mania. Nice. The Menagerie also is known for trying to rob a club where Nadia Van Dyne was celebrating her birthday with numerous other heroes, which, as you can imagine, it didn't go too well for them. Number two, Atlas. Coming our way from the original Thunderbolts team is Atlas. Atlas, however, was formerly known as Goliath, and prior to that, actually had a series of other code names, including Power Man. Atlas, as one of the original members of the Thunderbolts, was also known for being a member of the Masters of Evil, who were revealed, of course, to be the team of heroes that we had come to know as the Thunderbolts. Dun dun dun, what a twist. Atlas himself is known for being able to change size due to pin particles and his ability to charge himself with ionic energy, or his ionic energy form, if you will. He can use ionic energy not only to change his size, but he can also channel it into increased durability or super strength as he sees fit. I would normally put Genis Val and Moonstone above someone like Atlas, but it also should be noted, I think, and I think this is really important, that Genis Miss Val is, you know, currently dead, while Atlas is currently virtually indestructible and immortal. Through his connection to ionic energy, as long as he has the willpower to, he can basically
basically resurrect himself pretty much indefinitely because he's ionic energy. Does that make sense? <laughs> I think it makes sense. I think it's pretty cool. Number one, Kobik. Kobik is a being who is the cosmic cube incarnate. While Kobik is often known for taking the form of a child, as during her creation she felt broken and confused, she is extremely powerful. Harnessing the power of the cosmic cube, which of course is her, means that Kobik can alter reality with a mere whim, and beyond that has access to seemingly limitless power. Kobik would end up being influenced by Red Skull into warping reality so that that Captain America became a longtime Hydra loyalist and sleeper agent, with Kobik believing this was a good thing to do due to Red Skull's influence. While Hydra Steve was plotting away and eventually wreaking havoc on the US, Kobik would end up joining forces with Bucky Barnes, the Winter Soldier, in an attempt to prove herself to be capable of good. Obviously, she felt a little bit bad about everything that had gone on. Kobik would gather her own team of Thunderbolts, who Winter Soldier would then lead. <laughs> 